and no sleep story posted by Taj Isli. I went on a trip to Morocco. I shouldn't have gone to explore the haunted caves. Last summer, I turned 20, and my parents had planned a five-day trip to Morocco for me and my 17-year-old brother Maishas. I had to admit, it was an absolute thrill for a Finn girl who had just graduated to go on a trip abroad. So, in mid-July, we arrived in Arces 8 and checked into our five-star hotel. We spent the first day in a visit to the surrounding of the city. Landscapes were incredible. The day after we went to a place in the middle of the desert called Mizga, very known by its incredible sunset, we spent the night there and returned back to our hotel the day after. Then we went to an ancient castle that was apparently built in the 10th century for a powerful warlord. By the fourth day of our trip, we had met a group of Moroccan students. They were from a Moroccan international university and were staying at the same hotel as us. My brother and I befriended a student named Isam and his girlfriend. They were both studying sustainable energy management and were about to graduate. Late that night, around the hotel pool and during a casual conversation, Isam mentioned some local myths about the country's wilderness. He claimed that there are some places, in the desert for example, where no one goes or crosses. Those locations are said to be haunted by jinn mythical entities that are well known and feared in Morocco. Maishas and I laughed at it, saying that ghost stories are always made up by people to scare other people. Isam and even his girlfriend were adamant that jinn are not ghosts or spirits, and the locals are terrified of even bringing up the subject of these entities or the locations where they are said to live. Apparently, one of those haunted locations happened to be not far from Oaxas 8, the city where we were staying. It was some cave situated between hills near a small village above Fint Oasis, a place we visited a day earlier. Isam explained that his cousin, who lives in Oasis 8, had seen the caves before, and reported that the place freaked him out. See, I am a skeptical, but this gin was something new I've never heard before. Now I was curious, and my skepticism had given way to excitement. Those haunted caves had to be explored. I asked Isam if he could ask his cousin to give us a ride so we can visit the caves tomorrow afternoon. Isam took out his phone and called his cousin. After a few minutes, he hung up and said that his cousin will pick us up at the hotel tomorrow at 6.30pm and drive us to the oasis. We'll have enough time to explore the caves before heading back around 9pm. Great. We said me and Maishas with excitement. The next day, at 6.30 p.m. as planned, we were waiting in the lobby. Isam's girlfriend did not show up. Isam said jokingly that she was probably too scared to go see the forbidden caves. When Isam's cousin called to say he was there, we all went to meet with him in the front door of the hotel. After a brief introduction, we get into the car and headed to our destination. The oasis was 12 kilometers south of Oasis 8 but the rough dirt road would take us 45 minutes to get there, according to Isam's cousin. I was getting little nervous and wary about all this trip, but I couldn't admit it to Maishas. On the way, Isam's cousin told us how he discovered the caves by accident a few years ago while conducting research for his geology degree. He said that as he approached the caves, one of the villagers noticed him from afar and dissuaded him from entering. The villager told him about the jinn who live in the caves and the frightening stories of people who got inside and went insane or simply disappeared. Isam's cousin stopped talking for a moment then he added, I am a scientist who, on principle, believes in facts and data. But I remember having a very uneasy feeling while talking to the villager, as if I was being watched or something. My reason was overtaken by an unexplainable fear, and I ended up turning away from the caves. We all fell silent, and no one spoke for the rest of the ride until the oasis appeared. We drove for about five minutes on an unpaved road until we arrived at a small village. The houses, like the other villages we had visited around Oatsas 8, were made of clay and all gathered in one place. The villagers, on the other hand, surprised me. Unlike the other locals we'd met, the few people lurking behind their doors gave us hostile looks. I was taken aback. Moroccans are known for their incredible hospitality and openness to foreigners, 
as I discovered since our arrival in Morocco, it was unnerving, as if no one wanted us there. I exchanged a quick glance with Maishas, who also appeared surprised. The car stopped at the end of the road, beneath a pair of date palm trees. We got out of the car, and I immediately started taking pictures with my phone. It was sunset, and the scenery was absolutely stunning. Marvelous, I thought as I snapped photos. Isim's cousin eventually turned toward us and told us that the people from the village beneath the caves don't like strangers wandering around. So we should explore the outside quickly and not linger too long. He then pointed to the direction of the caves and took the lead. Isim followed, then me, then Maishas. The soil was mostly made up of small pebbles and a thin layer of sand. We were near an oasis, and there were some palm trees and bushes scattered about. But, curiously, there were no birds chirping, insects buzzing, or breezes, just silence. Our footsteps were the only thing we could hear. I am accustomed to wilderness in Finland and that silence was quite troubling. I started to have a feeling of uneasiness, but I said nothing to the others Isim's cousin said that at the end of the trail, we'll probably have to walk and climb some boulders to get to the caves. Me and Maishas nodded then we headed towards the hill. We walked for about five more minutes on a rocky path before we saw them. The haunted caves. In front of us was a medium-sized hill with an odd structure that resembled small caves. When we got closer, the caves looked more like small doors, as if they had been carved into the rock. I took a few photos from a distance. We were making our way through the boulders when a loud groan came from behind me. Maishas had tripped on some pebbles and landed on his back. Fuck. I muttered, I think I may have twisted my ankle, said Maishas while checking his foot. Isim and his cousin stopped and came closer to see what was going on. I looked down at Maisha's feet, then up at the caves, only a few meters ahead of us. I can't go any further. We should go back before it gets dark. The others agreed to resume and return to the car, but I was irritated. It's impossible to be this close and not be able to see the caves from inside. If the caves are as beautiful as the oasis, it will all be worth it. I made my decision. I turned to look at Isim and his cousin and said, go ahead. I will continue to the caves. I'll just take a quick look and snap a few photos. I'll be following you right away. Without waiting for a response I hurried toward the caves. When I stood in front of the caves, I noticed that they were human-sized, narrow openings carved directly into the rock, only a few inches above ground. There was seven entries at the bottom and about 13 smaller ones above. I took a few more photos, despite the fact that it was hot outside, a cool breeze was blowing from the entryway where I was standing. It was still daylight outside and all I could see, now that I was close, was a sort of an empty chamber and another entrance at the far end. The temptation was overwhelming. I turned around to see Maishas being carried back to the car by Isim and his cousin. Then I looked back to the cave and entered. Something shifted the moment I put my foot on the inside. I walked inside the chamber and headed toward the entry at the opposite wall. While adjusting my vision to the darkness, I felt a slight movement of air behind my ear, like a breath. Chills ran down my spine. When I turned around, there was nothing. The hair on my arms stood up, a sudden cold enveloped me, and I knew that I wasn't alone. The chamber was neat and empty, but I sensed that there was something else I couldn't see. The silence was unsettling, and it created a void in my mind filled with all sorts of creatures and horrifying stories I'd heard. I was squinting my eyes to try to see what was inside the entrance. It looked like a tunnel. Against all my instincts, I decided to step a little bit inside. It was like something was pulling me inside. It was too dark there and I didn't have a flashlight or a phone, so I thought I'd use the flashlight on my camera. The more I advanced the more I had the uneasy feeling I was being watched. But I quickly dismissed it, telling myself that it was all in my head, as I continued my way inside, flashing with my camera from time to time. I could now hear a faint sound, as if it was a set of footsteps behind me. Despite how unsettling it was, I refused to look back and continued. 
It must be just an echo of my own footsteps, or so I convinced myself, because the alternative of someone or something stalking behind me was too terrifying to even consider. Now I had advanced a good distance inside, and I could see with my the flashlight that I had entered a sort of patio surrounded by another set of openings carved into the rock itself. My hearing became more acute as I walked on tiptoe with my hand against the rocky wall. I was on high alert, and the slightest sound would startle me. It was as if the air around me had stopped moving. My step sounds have been muffled. Then I started to hear a humming noise. It appeared to come not from outside but from inside my ears. At first it was subtle and unsteady, almost like a pulsing. The noise then abruptly changed to a piercing sound, similar to what you hear when you put your TV on mute. I went completely still, then a gut-wrenching, blood-curdling scream pierced the cave's walls. I felt myself leaving my skin, I covered my mouth with my hand to hold my squeal of terror. I then heard them. Voices. Hundreds of voices speaking all at once in a language I didn't understand. It was all around me, coming from all sides. When all the voices suddenly stopped, I felt a tightening around my chest grow stronger and stronger. I stopped my breath and I heard, nothing. Then the breeze against my neck blew again. Something brushed against my cheek. We've been expecting you, said a hushed voice. I almost had a heart attack, my fight or flight instinct kicked in, and I took off running. I was out of breath as I raced, popped against the walls and stumbled trying to find my way. I kept hearing footsteps following me but when I looked over my shoulder there was noting. My heartbeats were racing and I felt like I'm going to throw up. Why I can't find the entrance? It wasn't that far. Am I lost? Exhausted and felling dizzy I stopped running to catch my breath. I couldn't stop myself from retching, so I did it again and again. The only thing I could hear was my own retch. When I emptied my stomach I began whipping my head around. Then I heard my name coming ahead of me. I didn't recognize the voice. Could it be Isam or his cousin? I raced toward the sound and finally got to the entrance of the cave. Outside, it was already dark. I tried hard not to hurt myself while tumbling down the boulders. Then I dashed to the car. What were you doing? We've been awaiting you for nearly an hour. Maishas inquired, his face concerned. An hour? I was taken aback. It seemed like only 10 or 15 minutes had passed in there. Is everything all right? Asked Isam's cousin, who was also concerned. We should leave. Right away. I nearly yelled. We went back to the hotel in total silence. We never talked about what happened that night. And every time Maishas brought up the subject again, I became irritated and asked him to leave me alone. What I experienced that night would haunt me for the rest of my life. All I wanted was to forget about it. It has been almost six months since we were on that trip. Tonight, I awoke suddenly, my heart pounding inside my chest. I sat up in the dim light and listened. Inside my ears, a pounding sound was pulsing. The sound then changed to a piercing one. My skin crawled as I heard the sound. Then I heard it again. The hundred voices in my bedroom hushed. You will never be alone. Again.